BS Free Witchcraft is a production of the Nerd and Tie Podcast Network. Nerd and Tie produces podcasts ranging from actual play to true crime, and you can find more at nerdandtie.com or join our Discord by going to nerdandtie.com slash Discord. Welcome to BS Free Witchcraft, your monthly guide to the modern witchcraft movement. My slot as usual, well, bullshit. I'm your host, Trey Dorn. It is July of 2024, and because it's July... It means we're doing the same thing we do every July, and that is dedicate an episode to questions from listeners just like you, because you you may be one of the people who wrote the question in, because, again, these came from listeners. So some of these questions may not only be from people like you, they may actually be from you if you are one of those people. Anyway, so the way this works... And over the last several months, people have sent me questions in through the form on uh, bsfreewitchcraft.com. And I skimmed them. I pulled a, I tried to pull a variety of, of questions. And I'm going to answer some of them. Um, I'm going to anonymize them. I don't say who, uh, who sent the question. I try to remove details that would make people identifiable. That's part of the rules. But effectively, I'm just going I have not prepared a single answer. I never prepare answers ahead of time because I am a lunatic. There, one year I did have to completely edit out an answer to a question and redo it because I gave such a bad answer. I was like, no, you're, you're not going to tell this person that and do that again. But for the most part, this is just me unedited uh, reading these questions and giving you the answer I have off the top of my head. With no preparation. But trust me, it, it should be good. It should be fun. We get some interesting conversations out of this. So let's just go with the first question I have here, which is titled, Being Sick and Doing Witchcraft. Hello. I'm not sure if you've touched upon this, but I've read and searched that you shouldn't try to do any spells or rituals while being sick, whether it be a cold, flu, or anything. So my question, is that true? I recently got an illness where I'm sick 90% of the time, and the time I'm not sick, I try catching up on the life I don't want to screw myself over, so I figured, why not contact you? Thank you, Vince. Greatly appreciate it. Um, so the only thing I say about being sick is just the, the, the same warning about being tired in general, right? It's... Depending on the the form of witchcraft you're practicing, depending on the uh, particular like paradigm of magic you're working with, sometimes it can be um, tiring for some people to do magic. And if you are in a state of being tired already, then it can um, be difficult. If you're working with flame that might aggravate a respiratory condition, that is something you have to take into account, but it's just basic physiological things then, though, right? Like, if it's something that would lead you tired and you have less energy because you're sick, you may tire yourself out more than you realize. Or if you are, have, like, a respiratory illness um, that smoke could aggravate and you're inhaling a lot of incense or, or things like that, that can aggravate what you're dealing with. But overall, that's the only thing I would really be concerned about are, like... Just because you are dealing with a physio- or physiological things that you could stress yourself with. Um, if you don't feel like there are entire paradigms in School of Magic that would not do that at all, right? That would not cause those issues. So I would say it's really contextual, but it's not really, it's not a magical reason why you shouldn't, right? Like the spell is going to do the same thing that the spell always does, uh, in my opinion. And I'm assuming you want my opinion because you asked me the question. Um, People may disagree with me, but I think that's, like, magically, I don't think it would be a problem. I think just like anything else while you're sick, you just got to pace yourself. And again, there's respiratory illnesses and smoke do not mix. So do that in a well-ventilated area and wear (laughs) wear a mask so you don't aggravate your, your lungs. So no, I think that people put up a lot of a lot of different traditions. Will put up a lot of different rules, and uh, the reasons for them 
may feel real to them. And I want to respect within that tradition, but I also want to say, if you are not constrained by the rules and policies of that tradition, don't don't uh, tie yourself down unless you want, unless you're into it, unless that's your thing. <laughs> Hopefully that made sense. I, yeah. Next question. Uh, someone asks, what's the difference between New Age and Witchcraft? Uh, high trace is something I've been thinking about for years, actually, since the time of a spiral of BS episode. Basically, I agree with the stuff that you said about the law of attraction is utter ableist bullshit. Still, I found myself doubting the difference between it and ye old regular spells. Like, both are attempts to manifest something, in quotes, be it that the, the word has been very New Age coded, by using the power of will slash spirit. So, like, is the only difference between law of attraction and spells that we have ingredients? Because I certainly hope not. It certainly feels like we differ more substantially than that, yet I have a hard time finding any of the tangible differences. What are your thoughts on that? It's This is really simple. Law of attraction, and if you go back to the law of attraction episode, I talk about this. Law of attraction, it says it's happening all the time, whether you do it or not. Like, you are manifesting your world around you regardless of what you're doing. Every negative thought you're having is supposed to be negatively affecting your world. All of it. Um, and so, and it's this constant unending thing that you have to police every thought, everything. When we talk about spellcraft, we're talking about, yes, we are... Like, especially under, like, um, a lot of things which are which borrow from, like, uh, ceremonial magic, talk about things like will. Like, Thelema is all about the will. Um, that idea is about actively making a choice and doing a thing, right? Like, me sitting here, not casting a spell, I am not having an effect on the universe besides, like, just I'm inhaling and exhaling. Like, I'm increasing the carbon dioxide in this room. Like, I am not creating a mystical effect on the world unless I shoot. And so that's the difference, right? Law of attraction is always on. And that's why it's so dangerous, because it teaches you to blame yourself for the bad things that happen to you. I must not have been thinking positively enough if these bad things are happening to me. It's my fault, right? That's what it's saying. Law of attraction is supposed to be this thing that is always occurring all the time. When we talk about spell work and spellcraft, we are taking an action that does a thing. Even if you fundamentally believe that it's still will upon the universe, it is only you are choosing when to exert that will, if that's the kind of, like, if that's the paradigm of spellcraft we're working under, right? Which not everybody does. So that's the difference. Like that you are making an active choice to do a thing, and that your neutral state is not affecting the universe in that way. Where Law of Attraction says your neutral state is. And that's why the Law of Attraction is shitty and victim blamey and bad. <laughs> that is... That is the long and the short of it, right? It's this, and that's why, like, it's such a slippery slope. That's why I don't like using the word manifest. Even when people mean it the way that, like, I, I mean, spell work and things like that, I don't like it. Like, and a lot of witches do it, right? You will see it all the time. You will see it all the time. Um, and I don't like it because the implications are very law of attraction y. And law of attraction is not about making a choice. It's not about taking control. It is saying that effectively that you don't have control because you don't have control over your emotions. You have control over the actions that you do having that emotion, but most people do not have significant control over their actions, over their emotions. Dear Lord, everyone has control. Over, you have control over your actions. You don't have control over your emotions. Deal with it. You have control over your expression of those emotions, but, you know. I mean, obviously, there are ways to self-control. It's you, you get what I'm saying, right? You get what I'm saying. You cannot be blamed. Like, I have, um, I get, I have an anxiety disorder. I get panic attacks. And my brain goes into very self-blaming mode, and I have to walk myself out of it. But... That negative thoughts, like if I were a person who believes in the law of attraction, like imagine that, right? Like that I would start blaming myself for every bad thing that happened 
because I had these negative thoughts that I could not control. And that's... That's bad, kids. That's very bad. <sighs> Anyways. <laughs> moving on. Next person asks... Um, Oh, they'll skip by the part where they tell me they like me. Um, what is your opinion of witches showing how to do spells online? I know they are not likely truly casting the spell, but are doing a how-to. Would it be better if the flash was left out and they are presented more practically to help people find spell work starting places? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so... Yeah, I'll tell you, when I started that sentence, it's not where I thought the question was going to end, but that's actually a really good question. Um, the entire reason why I started this podcast is because I got tired of every piece of witchcraft content being very finger-waggly, you know, like, ooh, and it's mysterious, and we're in touch with it. I am in touch with my inner god and goddess. The energy flows through me. Now, we will place the lavender in the pouch next to our white candle as the soft me No, fuck it. <laughs> I am a very, like, the entire thing. Like, look, aesthetics are fun, but I am a very blunt, direct and very practical and pragmatic about all of this stuff. And um, I prefer content that way. So, yeah, would it, would it be better if they presented it that way? I mean, here's the thing. Some people are watching those spell tutorials or spell, like, examples and things like that because they want the vibe. And if what you're going for, if, if, you're, if your interest in consumption is the vibe... You know, those can be fun to watch, even because a lot of the people who watch those spells are not actually going and doing them. People who consume content, how-to content, often don't do the thing. Like, Bob Ross had many viewers who never picked up a paintbrush because they found it enjoyable to watch the aesthetic experience. So, like, that's not what I'm into. That's not what I want, but there are people where that's what they want. Um, would it be nice if we saw examples from across the spectrum, like like the wiki how? <laughs> I mean, there, I guess there is actually like witchcraft stuff on wiki how, um, but like when we get the like the the very like pragmatic, explanatory, like explanation of stuff alongside like the aesthetic -y things um absolutely it would be nice if we had that variety but like any sort of content production there has to be a market for it right like i'm not the biggest witchcraft podcast in the world because i d tell people what i think <laughs> you know like we all saw what happened when i read that book <laughs> like it's uh but I know that not every not everybody wants this experience, what we're doing here, right? Not everybody wants this. Do I think it would be helpful if there was more of this? Absolutely. But, you know, I'm just going to say this. Like, if that's what you want, you might have to be the person who does it. Because I wanted a podcast with a certain tone, witchcraft podcast with a certain tone, and I could not find it. And so I started this show like six years ago, or however many years it's been. I think it's been six. But yeah, I couldn't find it, so I made my own. That's often what happens in my life. Couldn't go to an anime con? Started one. Um, yeah. Hopefully that makes sense. Going down to the next question. Next person wrote, Hi, Trey. I have some questions about your opinions on initiation slash self-dedication rituals. 
I've been a practicing Wiccan for a few years now, and I know you personally don't believe someone is truly a Wiccan until they perform a self-dedication ritual in the case of a solo practitioner like me. My main question is, how common a belief is this, do you know? Should I expect to be shunned for this in Wiccan communities? If so, if so, I'd just like to be prepared for that if I ever do find myself in any Wiccan spaces. I've never felt like I needed to do this, and to do a ceremony for the sake of having done it for the approval of others just doesn't feel right. But I want to know, I want, okay, I want to know at least if I sign up for if I skip this step in my practice. Love the part. First off, no one's going to ask. I'm just going to tell you this flat out. No one's going to ask. Once they find out that you are, um, people might ask what kind of a Wiccan you are, right? Because there's a lot of kinds. Um, and if you tell them you're solitary eclectic, no one's going to ask. <laughs> like, if you were, like, saying you were a part of a British traditional Wiccan, like, if you were saying you were, you know, Alexandrian or something, like, then then people might ask, like, who initiated you or where you were initiated, depending on the the group and what level of secrecy would be implied and the level of people and what else the people asking would have asked, stuff like that. But no one is going to ask you um, because they're just going to assume you did it. It's the reason why I say that a self-dedication is important. Like that is the, the key thing, like an initiation or self-dedication to becoming a Wiccan because that commitment to Wicca is Wicca is an orthopraxic religion, right? While there are very loose differences, like while the actual set of definitions for like what make up the rituals can change so much between traditions, um, Wicca is not very heavy on the actual beliefs, right? We have a god, we have a goddess. There is um, the reed, which is not like a cosmic law. It's just advice because um, Doreen Valiente wrote it. Um, based on an idea that Gerald Gardner had. And it's just, you know, but the the read, like, but most of this, when we talk about, like, well, we can start, we talk about, like, okay, and we observe these holidays and we perform these rituals. And it's, it's an orthopraxic religion, right? So that's why in my, and, you know, a self-dedication is not like a complicated, it doesn't have to be a complicated thing, Right. Um, but it is a thing. And when it's a religion based on practices to fit the definition, and especially, especially one with such loose definitions and loose, well, not necessarily definitions, but loose consistency between traditions, I feel like there has to be kind of like a minimum, like, this is the thing that makes it this. This is the thing that doesn't. And I, I feel like we have to draw those lines somewhere. And I feel like since it's such an open thing and we've had self-dedication uh, traditions, D Doreen Valiente wrote one at one point, like for, for decades, since the 70s. Or I can't remember if that was published in the 60s or 70s, but like it's we've had it for a long time, longer than most Wiccans have been alive, honestly. Um that I don't think it's that hard of a thing to say that a self-dedication is a required part of being a Wiccan. That said, no one's going to ask you. Like, I don't want you to feel discouraged from interacting. Here, I encourage you that if you want to call yourself a Wiccan, just do a self-dedication. Make that choice for yourself. Um, but that said... I mean, because you don't have to be a Wiccan. You can just be a witch and not be a Wiccan. Like, that's also, you know, an option. But all that said, that's just my opinion. I'm not in charge of you. I'm not in your head. I'm not in your house. Um, importantly, and I don't want to discourage you from interacting in public spaces, and importantly, no one is going to ask and honestly, most of them probably aren't going to care. Um, I care more about it maybe than a lot of other people do. I'm not going to lie. I mean, here's the thing. <laughs> You're way more at risk of running into, and like, I don't want to, like, I'm not trying to talk smack about British traditional Wiccans at all. Like I have, I have friends who are, 
I have had good experiences with a lot of them, right? Like most weird traditional Wiccans I have met have been lovely people and have been great and accepting and cool. So I, I'm starting this out saying this, but there are some who do not view solitary... And this used to be like a larger problem in the community than it is now. Um, I think at this point, I tend to see them more happy just to see other Wiccans, whatever kind. <laughs> but um, this is like a much bigger problem in during the earlier during the like the big explosion in the 90s of solitary eclectics like solitary eclectics have been around for uh much earlier than the 90s honestly it's been the dominant form of the religion for most of the history of the religion um but especially in the 90s and early 2000s um with the explosion of of wiccan solitary eclectics there were uh, and there still are i know these people are still out there they are just the a vast minority like I'm like so when I'm saying this, I don't want you to think this is going to be like everybody or even most people, and you may never meet a person like this because they are slowly dying out. Um, but there are people who don't view solitary eclectic Wicca as legitimate Wicca, and so they will take that much more of the issue. Um, I'm not saying that will happen. There's a good chance you'll never encounter a person with that attitude, but I have encountered people like that. And, um, it's, it, it, that, that I'm just saying that's a far bigger risk than anybody actually caring about. And, you know, here's the thing, like I say that, like, I consider that to be a requirement to be a Wiccan, right? Um, if I met you, I'm not going to be a dick. Like, we're just going to have a disagreement about an idea. And, um, the one thing you definitely have to get used to in witchcraft spaces is that people are going to fundamentally disagree with each other on a lot of ideas and we all got to be cool with it. Right? <laughs> like, there are so many different opinions on how witchcraft works and like how all this stuff happens and like the best way to do a ritual and all this stuff. So many fucking opinions that, um, if you're not comfortable disagreeing with someone in the room about the definition of something or about the best way or the way things should be, you got to move past it. And if you find someone pushing that real hard on something inconsequential, right? Like the only things that like I'm really hard and fast on are things that hurt other people, right? Like, you know, we talk about racism. We talk about things like that. Like that I'm like, no, get on board or get out. But like when it comes to like philosophy and things like this and like the kind of things we're talking about where the only person affects is you. I I might have an opinion if you ask me. Like I I have an opinion. I'm I'm telling you only I'm only telling you my opinion on this because you ex explicitly asked me, right? If I met you in person and you told me this, um I might have a I might strike up what I would do is I would strike up a conversation about it, right? Like I would like talk to you and like, I would, you probably, you might end up in a few debates that that's a risk. Like you might end up uh, getting debated about definitions of then what words mean of what qualifies as what and all that, but not like, but you're not going to see like discrimination against it or, and I don't think you'll see hostility towards you. And again, if you don't bring it up, no one's going to ask. So, you know, I do think that you will have to, um, if you do bring it up, you might end up having to explain why you think that it it qualifies or why it's right. You know what I mean? Like, but you invite that conversation when you bring it up, right? Like, it's, no one's going to ask you. It only becomes a thing if you make it a thing. <laughs> Hopefully that made sense. Moving on. Next question. Hi, Trey. For your Q&A episode, I would love to know, what are your thoughts on the overall declining opinion of Wicca and Gerald Gardner among younger pagan slash witches, particularly on platforms such as TikTok? Ah. All right. So the stories I keep seeing are amazing because people like, look, I make fun of Gerald Gardner sometimes. We don't like Gerald Gardner is not on a pedestal in in the I don't think like most of the community hasn't been like he's thought like 
he's the guy who started the religion, but he's not a prophet, right? Like he's Gerald Gardner at most is respected because he is the creator of the form of witchcraft that we're practicing, right? Like it takes a certain amount of creativity of like planning, but he also simultaneously was just some guy, right? Like he was a witch. We as witches have the same authority as he did as Wiccans. But so like, we've never been like, you know, rah, rah, Gerald Gardner's so great. I mean, I'm sure somebody has, but most of us have been like, Gerald Gardner is a guy, especially when you consider that like when he created the religion, he wasn't claiming to be the creator of the religion. He was claiming to be just a new initiate, like not new, new because he was, but like he just claimed to be another initiate into this mystery faith. He presented him himself. He presented himself as just an equal to everybody else doing it. Like he set that tone. He also made, he was high priest and, you know, wanted to be important within his organization group. Like I'm not saying he was a man without ego and perfect. He was a, you know, upper middle class British guy. Um, but you know, so what happens. And so what's happened though, is that, um, the pushback against Wicca has been really interesting because what really happened was is that uh, Wiccans became such a huge, massive thing in the 90s, right? Everything was Wicca, Wicca, Wicca. Like, lots of stuff got republished under with Wicca being put into the title because Wicca sold books. And all this stuff got Wicca, Wicca, Wiccan. And because all pretty much all modern witchcraft for decades was classified under Wicca, every shitty thing that a witch did got blamed on Wicca because it was a shitty thing being done by a Wiccan. Because I don't know if you've noticed this, most Wiccans are white. And middle class and upper middle class suburban white people do shitty things all the time. I know! So when it comes into things like, say, the, the like, especially with so much New Age bleed over, like we get like a bunch of appropriation of Native American stuff. We get appropriation from, um, you know, different ethno religions. You know, we take things from, you know, uh, my brain is blanking on certain words, uh, but from from African traditional religion, things like that. I think it's, the, but anyways, we, we're taking from people we shouldn't be taking from who say, please don't take this. And white people are like, no, I'm going to do it. It Wiccans were the one doing it because Wiccans were 90% of the public facing witches. <laughs> like, I want to say, I, I want to say public facing, like the, the most publicly known about, because there are, of course, other witchcraft traditions that were existing at the time, but Wiccans took up all the air in the room. So. That happens. So this reputation, so like, you, you know, it's, you get Native American people complaining about people stealing their stuff and they see a bunch of people calling themselves Wiccans doing it and Wiccans culturally appropriate becomes the narrative. And it's true. Wiccans were doing that. But it wasn't a part of actual Wicca. Like, that's the thing is it's like, I've, I've had these conversations before where people be like, oh, Wicca is cultural appropriation. And I ask them to list the things, right? It's real simple. Like, tell me what it is. And they always list a bunch of stuff that is stuff that Wiccans are doing, but it's not actually a core part of like the actual like orthopraxy or orthodoxy of the religion core, right? It is stuff that some shitty white person did while being a Wiccan. And you're right. We need to cut that shit out. But Wicca got the reputation. Now, and here's where we get to the thing. On places like TikTok, you hear people saying, like, Wicca culturally appropriates because Wiccans culturally appropriated. And I repeat, this is, again, not a Wicca problem. It's a white people problem. But so we have the rise of witches who don't call themselves Wiccans. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but people on social media always don't look deeply into what they're saying or spouting. So, let 
they repeat words and they say things like, oh, I'm, you know, Wicca's bad, Wicca's evil. And like they repeat the thing over and over and over again without really thoroughly examining it. And it gets them views and it gets them watch time on TikTok. And then new people without context watch that content and they repeat the things because that's what they've been told. And people don't read past the headline in general these days. So the best part is, is that now witchcraft has become far more popular on its own. What we see now in which is are all of these witchcraft books being published, which are Wicca books from the 90s with witchcraft with Wicca scratched out and traditional witchcraft written in. And this is this is happening right now. Publishers are doing this. And you'll find this book like, oh, it's traditional witchcraft, traditional witchcraft, traditional witchcraft. You open it up. It's fucking Wicca. Like pure uncut wicca with the serial numbers filed off because it's literally a wicca book from the 90s with retitled and find and replace the number of people who i have seen talk about how wicca is culturally appropriative and then turn around and demonstrate a bunch of spell stuff which was whole cloth lifted from wicca like, oh, I do traditional stuff. And then they, like, call the fucking corners, okay? <laughs> I can't. It's frustrating because I just want people to know the truth. Like, you don't have to like it. You don't have to join it. But be fucking accurate and know where your own shit came from because a lot of you don't. Um, As for the Joe Gardner stuff, it's really interesting. Um. Like, the game of telephone that's happened around Gerald Gardner is amazing. Like, Gerald Gardner could be a, a smug dick. He fictionalized things. He, you know. But, like, I see people talk about stuff, and I'm like, but but, but what you're talking about, it, that, that wasn't Gerald Gardner. That was Alex Sanders. Like, you're telling an Alex Sanders story. Like, stuff like that. There are so many things that get conflated with him which weren't him. Joe Gardner was not a perfect man. There's a lot of flaws. I mean, his prop, you know, his propagation of things like the, you know, Great White Wicca what witch cult Margaret Murray myth and things like the myth of the burning times. He's like I have the source like and if you go back to the I I did find the source of where the 9 million came from but the reason why people know the nine million number is Cheryl Gardner uh, and for a long time people thought he made it up until we finally like dug out the obscure source where some other guy made it up <laughs> um, and it's amazing to me because anyone who I've, I've ever met who is a Wiccan is just like Cheryl Gardner was just this guy like he had some good ideas on how to put together a witchcraft practice, pretty much lifting stuff from Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And uh, he hung out with some Rosicrucians in New Forest. But yeah. I think it's silly because... I only think it's silly... Here, look. I'm not telling you how to feel about Wicca. You can feel whatever you want. I am telling you, I'm sick and tired of people passing around untrue shit. Like, just say stuff that's real. Whew. On that theme, moving on to the next question. Subject, self-made religion. Hello. Recently, my friends and I have decided to make our own religion as a fun project. Later, one of my friends mentioned how they feel really connected to this religion and we want to know your thoughts on worshiping the deities we made slash named dude i'm a wiccan my religion was invented by a civil servant in the mid-20th century 
and the, the code breaker he brought on as his second high priestess. Um, you know, just something doesn't have to be old to be authentic. I do like when it comes to like the creation of your own gods. I think that there is a question of what your conception of those gods as deities are, right? Like, fundamentally, your cosmology is going to have to play into this, right? Because you're not handed these gods. Like, are you viewing them as faces of a pre-existing higher power that you're using these as an interpretive lens for that higher power? Or are you considering that your belief in a god creates the god? That is another way people look at this sort of thing. Um... Like, I think that's stuff you'll have to consider because you just said you made up the deities, right? So you have to um, think about the cosmology around that of how literally do you believe in them? And if you do believe in them literally, the mechanics of that, and if you don't believe in them literally, what they represent. Uh, but, dude, old does not mean better. Every religion had a day one. Newer is not bad. What's bad is, you know, when people abuse things, right? That's it. That's all that matters. So my my answer is to f feel free to do it. I think you have questions you need to ask because I, I am an advocate for asking questions and analyzing, right? So you made a new religion. You believe in it. Okay. Think about why you believe in it. Think about what that means. But other than that, go for it. Something doesn't have to be old to be legitimate. Right? Everything had a day one. You know, it's there's a Dorian Valiente quote that I like to throw around, which is, who initiated the first witch? And it has a lot of different meanings depending on the context, right? About authority, but it's who had the authority to do it. Well, the first witch just had the authority themselves. Every religion starts somewhere on its own. And you and your friend, if your friend or you ha really has faith in it, then what makes it less legitimate? But you do have to think about, I, I will say that you do have to think about the nature of the faith then, right? That's it. All right. Next question. I was wondering about magic slash witchcraft names. What do people use them for and how are some ways people come up with them? All right. So, all right. Magic names. Witchcraft names. Handful of reasons. First off, Wicca started itself off claiming to be a secret mystery tradition. Right? Therefore, to work within it, and also when you think about, like, technically, when Joe Garner started up, witchcraft was illegal in the UK. Barely illegal, but illegal. The idea within a secret mystery tradition, like, it's a secret, right? It's a secret organization. Therefore, within the organization, you are supposed to use a different name. <laughs> like, Gerald Gardner was sire. And so you see this and like, so the idea was is that you'd have your witchcraft name for privacy. That's why also like witchcraft authors for a long time often published under their magical names. Um, like they published under their magical names because in some cases, it was to look more authentic on the bookshelf. <laughs> Let's not kid ourselves. But in other cases, it's to... Like, I know one witchcraft author who publishes under a variation of her her magical name to separate her witchcraft life from her private professional life. So, like, her employer won't Google and find it. Right? Because almost every witchcraft author has a day job. No one's getting rich in this scene. <laughs> there are TikTok influencers who make more money than the witchcraft authors who actually, you know, do, although I don't want to shit on TikTok influencers for that. But yeah, it's there's 
we're a small group. No one's getting rich doing this. Um, it it may be that your favorite witchcraft author is working retail. Um, so that's that's like one of the practical reasons for it, right? The idea that within the witchcraft circles, like especially in Wicca, that it's supposed to be a secret. There is, are other reasons for it, other explanations. One is that what your magical name is is your true name, right? That you have your your legal name, your your name that you have, but but your magical name, your your witchcraft name, that is your true that is the name of your true self. And um you are selecting a name that you feel reflects the true you. And this is the version that I like. Uh, I turned out to be non-binary. Uh, <laughs> I renamed myself as a fucking teenager because I didn't connect with my birth name. <laughs> As part of becoming a Wiccan. Should have dawned on... Th that egg took a long-ass time to crack, y'all. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's... The idea is that it's, it's a name that reflects your true self. And as you perform magic, that you want to use a name that connects to your soul. And, like... It's a name that you would select upon, if you're a Wiccan, you'd select it upon your dedication or initiation, right? Like, as that is your name within the society of the Wicca. Um, not everybody does this, obviously, because not every, like it was a very Wiccan thing to do, right? So as Wicca has become less popular, it's become a thing fewer people do. Obviously. You know, it's... Non-Wiccans can will do this too, and that's cool, man. I think. Look, I think everybody should get. I think everybody should just have to pick, like, decide what their name is. <laughs> if you connect with your birth name, great. But I think everybody else, like, I don't care if you're cis, I don't care if you're trans, do not care. Everyone should, at some point in their life, reevaluate: Does this name fit me? And if it doesn't, just pick the new one. And we'll all call you that, and it'll be cool. I don't care if it's a magical name. I don't care if it's a mundane name. I do not care. Just everyone should take that opportunity and do it. <laughs> but those those are the reasons for the actual, like, uh, the magical reasons for it. All right. This question has a lot of preamble. I'm trying to decide how much of it to read to you guys. Yeah, I'll read the whole thing. Hey, Trey, hope you're doing well, and I love listening to your podcast and appreciate the work you've put into it. Over the years that I've practiced my craft, I've had time to figure out things I like to do that work for me and things I don't bother with anymore. That said, a while back, I came across an old spell I had pieced together many years ago and was surprised at how creative it was. I might, It might not be how I would do it now, but I could see the merit in what I did with the knowledge I had at the time. My questions for you are, as you've changed and grown in your craft over the years, do you ever find yourself looking back at the things you've tried with fondness or interest, even though you might no longer do things that way? Do you ever consider trying old spells slash practices again just to see how it goes. I would love to hear your thoughts. All right, so... I... If there's a kind of spell that I have stopped doing, it's because I really fucked something up. And I don't want to fuck it up again. Yeah, so... So the problem is, is that like there's this constant pressure in witchcraft to always be evolving and changing. I think this is great. I think this is great that you went back and you saw something that you did from when you were younger, and like it's not how I would have done things now, but it's cool, it's cool, it's cool. And like there's stuff I wouldn't do now that I did then, but it's more just like maybe that wasn't the physically safest thing to do. <laughs> like my adjustments are often things like that, right? Like, maybe I put myself in physical danger doing that spell that way. 
I shouldn't do that again. Um, I kind of settled into real comfortably with my craft a very long time ago. So, like, actually, the real problem with my answering this question is that if I look at a spell that I did 20 years ago, there's not a big difference between the way I would do it then and do it now. There's this expectation in a lot of witchcraft stories that you're constantly changing what you're doing. And it's great if you want to. Like, if that's who you are, awesome, right? Like... If, if you want to keep changing and trying new things and, and doing that, I encourage you. Awesome. Great. I figured out exactly what I wanted to do a very long time ago, and then I've kept doing that. And it's, so far, it's worked out. Like, it's not that I don't learn things. Like, if there's something I don't know how to do, I'll go look it up, research it, you know, figure it out. But I haven't really, besides like some basic safety stuff, which I don't like to give details about my actual like witchcraft, so I can't really explain other than if I told you, you'd be like, you fucking moron. Um, <laughs> like the actual way I perform the spells, though, and things like that is actually not all that different. Like, it's it's really like the same. And most of the changes that I made were convenient, like simplifying things in ways where it was easier just to pull it off. Like, it's not that I didn't like doing it the other way. It's just that I found easier ways to do it. So I'm like the worst person. To, this is like when people ask me, like, what good witchcraft books I've read lately. And I'm just like, bah. I know how to do my witchcraft. I don't need to, like, I only, I only go out and research new stuff if I don't know what to do. But if I already know what to do, I, I know what I want to do. Like, so it's, I know it's not satisfying, but I'm an old crank and uh, I guess probably the worst person to ask that question to. I'm glad you sent it in, though. I'm just disappointed that I didn't have something cool to say. Okay. God. Second to last question here. Hi, Trey. This is a long one. Just going to warn you. First, let me tell you that I owe my journey into magic to you. You showed me that I could believe in both magic and science at the same time, that I didn't have to toss common sense down the drain. Uh, so far, magic has been a little light during some dark times, so I wanted to really thank you from the heart. My question stems in part from the May episode, the one about the terrible book. It's in that stack of books behind me. Uh, <laughs> oh. In case you didn't know, there is a whole current of thought that maintains that all primitive societies that ever existed were matriarchal and worshipped the one true goddess... And every goddess from every Indo-European pantheon is a derivation of this one goddess. I don't know if it's part of Murray's witch cult. That is literally Murray's witch cult. Or something else. It's just to stop reading in the middle of that. That is, that's, that's literally what that is. That's the Margaret Murray's Great White Wicca witch cult. Pan-European, yeah, matriarchal thing. Some of the quotes you read from that book made me think of that, so I wonder if this is where the author is coming from. It's exactly where the author is coming from. Anyway, how about you make an episode on that and or the White Witch Cult? That's my that's an unhinged rant I can't wait to hear. Yeah, I so I talked about Murray a bit on an episode of um of Hex Positive, and then uh, the the I touch on it a little bit in the uh modern witchcraft history episode that we did at crit WitchCon a couple of years ago um like it's it's kind of been like weaved into a bunch of episodes i could do an episode dedicated to just that um all right so let me let me finish reading this first because now they've got actual questions as part of the letter uh now finally the actual question I'm a very rational person and coming from a background in science. Every time I try to read a witchcraft book, I get very put off by the BS is just everywhere. But I still don't want to limit myself to just those few books that are perfect. 
So how do I tell the difference between a piece of BS that I just skip and ignore and one that should make me question the whole book and potentially the author? Where do you draw the line? I would love it if you could share some of your red flags and the green ones too. Thanks again for being a voice of reason and have a good one. All right, so I've already said this. I don't read a lot of witchcraft books, but I do read, like I have read witchcraft books, right? Um, this is my thing. Um, like, cause I recommend Scott Cunningham's uh, guide to the solitary practitioner all the time for people who want to learn Wicca. And he's a little finger waggly for my personal taste, but it's good information. Right. So I guess I draw the line at accuracy. Um, if they start representing historical fact incorrectly, that's where you got to draw the line and you have to research, um, historical fact, like. I believe that presenting belief as belief is fine. Like that my problem is, is when things are spoken of as fact and not as opinion of the author. Like if we say that, like if we make a direct statement about a goddess or the goddess, if we're talking Wicca, um, and just kind of generally state it as fact, um, and it might not be like, so like, I would say like, first off, I don't like it. I don't like it when people don't cite stuff in books. So that's, but that's like so much witchcraft books, <laughs> people not citing their sources. Um, I guess what you have to take it for is what you will. Like I researched the author, right? I count where they're coming from. I figure out their credentials. What do they actually know? How long have they been practicing? What is their outside experience? What is their professional experience? Are they a religious study scholar? Like, do they have those credentials? That is part of it. Secondly, then I look at it as, um, is their history right? Right? Like, cause you can give me 10 paragraphs talking about how like, oh, you feel at one with the universe great as long as your history is right because the feeling of one with the universe that's a personal experience right that is a a personal driven thing and whether it's interesting to read or not it's still true because it's still there like emo they're, they're explaining their emotional connection to witchcraft in the process it's when we get into my problem is always when it comes to the history and the facts right like that's where you get me that's every single red flag. Because if you're coaching things in as these are my beliefs, you can say a lot of stuff and it's fine because you're saying your beliefs. If you're saying this is like versus like what like I want if you're gonna talk about a goddess, talk about your personal interpretation, explain that it's your personal interpretation of the goddess, not the historical interpretation, right? Separate that. Explain the historical, cite sources when explaining the historical, and differentiate that from when you're talking about your personal beliefs and your personal experiences with those same things. Because one, the history, that is objective, it should be objective. Your personal feelings and understanding, that's subjective. And if we disagree on the subjective, that's fine. I can still find value in the work if we disagree on the subjective. But if there is verifiable evidence sitting out there that you are wrong, then no. <laughs> like if you're mischaracterizing the religious practices of an ancient people that we are have well documented from, or if you're saying we have firm information on things that we know there's no document documentation from, then that's where, like, I take it down to, like, the definition of a witch. When someone explains the definition of a witch, as like, I've said a couple times in different episodes, that, like, the etymology past a certain point in Old English, we don't know where it comes from. Like, when we get back to witcha and witcha, the the root words, the the, the witcha, the, the masculine witcha, the feminine, feminine, there is no consensus among linguists about the origin of those words and what they mean. There are theories, there are debates. The moment that someone tells me a firm, definitive answer on the meaning of that word, I'm out. If they say, some think it means this, and just only present the one definition, but present it as not consensus, like, you know, some believe it comes from the, the base word to weave, some believe, that's fine. They are not giving an absolute. When you give the absolute 
when there is not an absolute fuck off. <coughs> Sorry, I coughed. And I don't have time. I'm literally like recording this at the last second that I can um, in the middle of the night because um, I am about to be without internet for a week. <laughs> Well, I'll have internet. It's very slow internet, so I wouldn't be able to upload an episode. So I'm trying to get this out before I go. Ugh. All right. Final question. Hi, Trey. Love the show. I was surprised to learn that most of the modern witchcraft movement was invented slash created in the 1950s. Before discovering modern witchcraft, I would have been sure that it came from at least the Victorian era, with all the witchy-looking shit they were getting up to. And it got me thinking. Okay, so I do want to cut in here. So we talk about the modern witchcraft movement coming from, like, the 40s, 50s. Like, there's, it's a fuzzy line when you draw it. Like, do you talk about when Gardner went to New Forest? Do we talk about when he created um, his own coven in Bricketwood? Like, all this stuff. Like, so 50s is, like, the kind of a rough line. Like, it it's actually might be earlier, but it doesn't matter. When we talk about that, we have to remember that uh, Wicca borrows heavily from things like Hermetic, like Golden Dawn stuff, right? Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and other um, occultism. There's a lot of that 19th century occultism in Wicca. When we talk about Wicca, the witchcraft starting in the mid 20th centuries, we're talking about kind of the move from ceremonial magicians to witches, right? Like calling himself a witch. And it's a different vibe. It's a very, like, you know, it's the vibe of it changes, but it is an inheritor of a lot of the stuff from that ceremonial magic. Like, if you look especially at Wicca, the way Wiccan ceremonies are constructed and set up, it's part of a long game of telephone um, throughout 19th century occultism. So, uh, like, you have to think about, like, you know, Gerald Gardner was involved in, like, ceremonial magic stuff, too, while he was also doing, like, the beginning of Wicca. So, like, it's, but we talk about, like, like the change from that, like, if, if you've ever talked to, like, if you ever go into, like, the ceremonial magic stuff and, like, like, it, it just, like, look at Crowley's stuff compared to the witchcraft stuff, and it's a, the, there's a vibe shift, there's a vibe difference, and so that's why, like, it's not that it's not connected to that stuff and not that that wasn't a direct contributor to the eventual rise of the modern witchcraft movement, but that's like, it's not to the 50s that we get the vibe of like, we're witches. Because, yeah, we got a different, we got a different vibe than the ceremony magicians. And if, if you like one, that's fine. But, you know, you can go left-hand path over there and I'm going to say my paths don't have hands. And that sex isn't evil. So why is it on that hand? Anyways. If a modern... <laughs> back to this question. I've only I've read like the tiniest bit of it. And I detoured. Um, if modern... I haven't even read the whole question. Like I have no idea what this is about to ask me. If modern witchcraft is so new and seemingly traces back to a handful of people getting naked in New Forest, yeah. can anyone invent a form of witchcraft from scratch using anything? Yes. I think I actually covered that in the previous question. I should really read these at a time. Oh, okay. There's there's more. There's more. That apparently wasn't this. The, the My question for this month is twofold, really. I guess this was all preamble. I, but I answered those. Everywhere and everyone who's talking about witchcraft says, do your research. But what if you wanted to create your own type of witchcraft completely from scratch for yourself for fun? One. Is it even possible slash allowed slash advised to try to come up create a brand new witchcraft tradition? And two, what research would you even do if you're trying to create something original? Besides checking that you're, what you're doing isn't a dick move, racist slash cultural appropriation, sexist, transphobic, etc. I'm um, also adding physically dangerous. <laughs> don't, don't do spells in traffic. Don't, don't do spells naked at night in the winter. Uh, don't. Uh, are there any witchcraft fundamentals everyone needs to know, or would it be better to go in blind, design something you love, and then maybe find an open tradition that aligns well and study slash follow that tradition? Any thoughts that you have are welcomed. I trust your opinions. You're able to use common sense and not afraid to call people out for behaving like dicks. All right, so 
really should have put this and the other question together about the new religion. So, um, how witchcraft works differs based on who you ask. I have my own, I have my opinions and I think I'm right, but I'm not an authority over other people who fundamentally disagree with me and we both think our spells work. So who's going to win? Right. (laughs) Um, so I guess like it depends in part on your paradigm that you're functioning under. So we talk about paradigms of magic. Um, we're talking about which is what's more important: the practice, the um, the ritual you do, being the exact right ingredients for ritual and things like that, or are is it a a matter of the intention? Like how much of intention is a part of this? How much is energy a part of this? How much of it, though, is instead using the inherent nature of the ingredients of the spell to do a thing? So it's like when you talk about like doing something new, it, it really depends on your your fundamental understanding of why we're doing what we're doing. And when we get into animism, this is my fun thing. Um, if you're an animist, does if you believe that a spell works only because you use the right ingredients... Is it possible that the spell's only working because the ingredient believes that it can do the thing? Like, this is where we dive, dive down, deep dive down a rabbit hole, right? Like, and so it's, you have to fundamentally understand why you think magic works. If you're a person who believes that it intention is the core and that you're just moving personal energy and that the rituals and spells you do are effectively ways to unlock that within yourself and perform those things, then no big deal, man. Anything goes. Anything works, right? If you believe in it hard enough, that's the right tool, right ingredient. It's easy to come up with entirely new ways to do things. If you believe that the correct ingredients are what's required, then in theory you would have to research, right, based on what different paths do with different ingredients and why they're supposed to work that way. There's nothing that says something new is less... There are people who will say it, but I think they're wrong. We fetishize the old and ancient here, right? It's that is a thing a lot of witches do. Um, but in truth, the something being new does not make it less valid in any way, shape, or form. And it's ridiculous to suggest otherwise, um, in my opinion. So, like, coming up with something from scratch, like when we talk about you ask me, like, should I research what is it depends on why you think magic works. Like it fundamentally depends, right? If you believe that all correspondences are just in the head of the witch and that they are casting a spell to move the universe in a way using energy, and these are just like the not the dot like the tools to unlock that within ourselves, and that the belief is the fundamental reason that it works, it's very easy to just come up with whatever the fuck you feel like at the time. Right. But if you're under the belief that those particular spell components do specific things and it's an inherent nature of the component. If you believe that it works that way, then you do need to research what components do what. Right. Um, And again, like you mentioned, like uh, not doing uh, I should say like unsafe things like don't consume certain herbs. Like safety, safety. There's poisonous stuff in the world. And there's other safety things that can risk you maybe almost falling into... Don't... Make sure you're physically safe at all times. Make sure you are dressed appropriately for the weather. Make sure that the ground is sure under your feet. Um, make sure lots of things. So... Yeah, it's. I think that what you have to do is you have to fundamentally figure out why you think things work the way they work. And that is when you will figure out what you need to research, right? If you are uh, at the two extremes, and there, there are many points in between, but the two extremes of the magic comes from the inherent physical characteristics of the components and the actions and the movements and the specific rituals, those are what creates the spell, then you need to research those elements. If you're of the belief is the fundamental part of this and these are just tools I'm using to unlock my own energy and movement and stuff, you come from that end of the spectrum, then you could just 
fucking fly by the seat of your pants and figure it out. And there are many points in between, but you need to determine that. If you can determine that, it should be pretty easy. Just fucking go for it, man. <laughs> okay, well, it is the middle of the night. <laughs> and uh, I, that is, those are all the questions that I pulled out for uh, this year's Q&A episode. Um, nice and long. I've got to now get this into the edit so I can get it up for my Patreon subscribers. That's right. This is a segue until the end parts because this show is brought to you by lovely Patreon patrons at patreon.com slash T-R-A-E-G-O-R-N. And remember, for supporting the show for just a dollar a month, you get to listen to these things a whole week early. And there are other perks. First off, and I know this is some of the stuff, the rest of the stuff isn't witchcraft related, but there are other perks. Like all Patreon subscribers get access to an EPUB of uh, Super Awesome Action Heroes um, Revised Second Edition, the uh, RPG that I created and is what the uh, Stormward Associates, the actual play show that I uh, that I run, and the Meat Grinder, the other actual play show that I'm I'm on. Both of those use this system. And you, just by being a Patreon patron, can download the EPUB of it for free. Uh, this is not the book that you're getting. This is the original second edition. Well, you're getting a second edition revised, which will not be on the shelves um, in, in, in paperback form or in uh, Kindle or anything like that for months. I'm not putting that until late in the year. So uh, you can get that right now. Even at $1 subscribers, you can get that. Um People at the $10 level get any book that I upload. Um, people at the $10 level will get ev every book in the Mia Grave series in uh, for for free. And the uh, we'll also be able to get copies of unconventional books up there. We're gonna I'm gonna be uploading one book a month um, for a few months. Uh, right now with just uh, the Witch and the Rose. An EPUB of that is available right now for everyone at the $10 level. And it is uh, next month, there will be a different book. And then in September, in, next, in, in August, a, uh, a, a collection of Unconventional that will be going up there will be in August's book. And then in September, bloody damn right, the, uh, the second Mia Graves book will become available as a... Um, an EPUB. And then we'll see from there. I might not do a new book every month, but over the next few months, those three books are going up. And so if you join at the $10 tier, you get all of those uh, as a bonus, as a part of your subscription. And those are um, those are DRM free. So if you leave the Patreon after you get them, you can still keep the book. So this show, like, again, just the $1 level, you get the show early, and you do get a copy of my role-playing game. So that's not a lot. But also people at the $10 level get their shout-out in the episode. So I am giving a shout-out to Lindsay Dosey, Bruce Norville, Courtney, Claire Dennis, Kayla Burkowski, and Pamela Stariak. I love you guys. You're great. You're you're keeping the lights on quite literally at the moment. So I do want to I do want to thank you guys for listening. If you want to follow the show on social media, I'm most active on Tumblr. It's been a hell of a time on my Tumblr at a post-break containment and hit over 20,000 notes. <sighs> um, but it's traegorn.tumblr.com. If you want to follow me on um, Twitter, it's uh, traegorn. Um, you can follow me on threads uh, at traegorn. Uh, if you want to follow the show on Facebook, you can follow me at Facebook.com slash BS Free Witchcraft. Uh, don't try to find my personal profile because that's where I talk to my mom. Um, people keep sending me friend requests. I'm never going to accept them. If you want to talk to me directly, the best places to do it are either the Nerd and Tie Podcast Network Discord, which you can find invite at nerdandtie.com slash Discord, or at the Nerd and Tie Podcast Network forums at nerdandtie.social. Um, those are two great places to talk to me directly. If you say something there, I will read it. And you can ask me anything year-round, and not just once a year when it comes to this kind of uh, an episode. <sighs> if 
with that, I will mention, um, I'm trying to stop plugging my books every episode, but I, I mentioned them in the Patreon. If you do just want to buy my books, um, they're available in paperback, and they I will put a link in the show notes, and that is fine. You should check out my books, but I've plugged them enough. Man, I'm tired. Man, it's the middle of the night, and I've had a long day. <laughs> so with that, Majikins, I'm going to wrap things up. I remember we're part of the Nerd and Tie Podcast Network. You can listen to a whole bunch of other cool podcasts like Hex Positive at nerdandtie.com. And uh, with that, I'm going to say uh, brick in our fingernail. Brick in our fingernails. Dirt in our fingernails, brick in our hands. I will talk to all of you next month. Oh my God, I still have to edit this show.